you can go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke. We're continuing our study through the gospel of Luke. And we're in chapter 5. You can turn to chapter 5. We'll be picking up in verse 12. Um, But for those who are joining us for the first time, or maybe you've missed a few weeks, as we go through uh, this study of the book of Luke, we're calling it good news for everyone, because that's Luke's desire as the author of this book, is that he wants to show that Jesus didn't just come to save the Jewish people, that he came for all people, that he came to seek and save the lost, and he even takes the lineage of Jesus all the way back to Adam to know that everybody is a part of that family. Last week, uh, Pastor Jason spent some time looking at Jesus calling this fisherman, Peter, telling him to cast his net over the other side, and the, the massive amount of fish that he brought in, the way that the Lord works in calling us, and how often it goes against what we would naturally think to do, and yet how something we could try and do and toil all night attempting to accomplish may produce nothing, but once the Lord is in it and calls us to do something, man, how it produces more than we could even imagine. Um, If you weren't here last week, you can grab that CD in the office. That'll help recap a little bit of the first part of Luke chapter 5 for you. But today we're going to jump right into verse 12 and take a look at Jesus' next interaction with the leprous man. Join with me, starting in verse 12. Here's what we read. And it happened when he was in a certain city, that behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus and fell on his face, And implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest, and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. However, the report went around concerning him all the more. And great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Would you join me as we follow suit and pray this morning? God, as we approach your word this morning, it is our desire that we would um, hear from you. Lord, my words have no profit to anyone here, but your words are living and active. They are powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, your words have life. Your words are a lamp unto our feet. They're a light unto our path. And God, this morning we desire to hear your words. Would you open our hearts? Would your word, like seed, find good soil? Would we not only hear these words and and allow them to penetrate our hearts, but would we also be a people that are doers of the word and not hearers only? God, would you speak to us in this time? Would we see how this man's story is our story? And would it be to your glory? And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you're taking notes and you want to write down a title this morning, you can just write down this one word, unclean. Unclean, that's what we're going to be seeing this morning as we look at this interaction of Jesus with this leprous man. Now we're not given a lot of detail as to exactly where it was that Jesus met this man. We're told it's a certain city, it's just a certain man. We don't get the specifics, but we can draw some conclusions. What's probably taking place here is that this would have been on the edge of a city. And the reason we can draw that conclusion is because this is a leprous man, full of leprosy, Dr. Luke tells us. And anyone that would have been full of leprosy was not allowed to just walk and wander throughout the city. They would have been on the outskirts of the city. They would have been cast out into a colony with other lepers as well. And so they weren't generally seen inside a city. But wherever Jesus is finding himself at this moment, somewhere in the Galilee area, he comes across... This man who is full of leprosy. Now in Bible times, no other disease was as feared as leprosy. They understood it to be somewhat contagious. They didn't know how fully contagious it was or wasn't. 
But they understood that when someone got leprosy, that it would affect their whole body. It usually began with fatigue and some pain they would experience in their joints. Some scaly spots would begin to appear and develop on the skin as the disease progressed. Eventually, the whole body could become covered with these pus-filled nodules. The appearance of the face of many people who had leprosy would begin to be altered. So the sufferer would come to resemble, some even described it like a lion's face. Those nodules would begin to grow even on their vocal cords so that the leper would actually speak with a bit of a raspy voice. The body was in a state of a, of a living decomposition. And so there would be a terrible stench that would follow the person who was suffering from leprosy. It attacked the nervous system, compromising the body's ability to feel pain. It would numb their sensory ability. It acted like an anesthetic. And so what this would cause is that the leper might be walking through a road, stub their toe, get a thorn in their leg, and not feel it and not be aware of it, so that that spot would become infected and slowly begin to decay. Maybe that injured foot that they feel no pain in would eventually begin to actually rot and need to be cut off or would fall off. Rats and other vermin would often chew on the sleepers in this leprous colony. In fact, one doctor I was reading about in a third world nation would often send home a cat with all of his patients who were leprous to try and keep the rodents away. Because of the numbingness of leprosy, they would not feel These animals gnawing away at their own bodies. Leprosy usually ran its course in about nine years from the time a person was first diagnosed with it to their eventual horrible death. One doctor called the leprosy disease a painless hell that would slowly begin to numb more and more of the body until eventually it would take their life. But one of the worst aspects of leprosy was not just all of this physical damage that it would do to your body, slowly decaying and numbing it for those years. But what one of the worst effects was is the the social isolation that this disease brought. You see, in Leviticus, they were given a law that was very clear as to the practice for lepers. In Leviticus 13... Verses 45 and 46, it tells us, Now the leper on whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn and his head bare. He shall cover his mustache and cry, Unclean, unclean, he shall be unclean. All the days he has the sore, he shall be unclean. He is unclean and he shall dwell alone and his dwelling place shall be outside the camp. Now by the time Jesus is on the scene here in Galilee, The rabbis had added many more restrictions on top of this Levitical law governing the lepers. It was said that if a leper even stuck his head within your home, your entire home was considered unclean. It was against their law to greet a leper. When it was determined that a man had leprosy, they would banish him from the village and he was no longer allowed to have communion with other people in that village. He had to leave his family and leave his friends and go out of the city to an isolated place. It was unlawful to ever approach a leper within six feet. And if it was a windy day, that rule changed from six feet to 150 feet. And so you can imagine the isolation. One who has leprosy is feeling not only being cast out altogether, but never even being able to approach anyone. In some situations, family would bring food and clothing and lay it in a designated location for their loved one. But after a time, the majority of the families would actually hold a funeral service and regard the afflicted person as dead. The leper had to tear their garments, as Leviticus tells us. They had to cover their upper lip so they wouldn't spread contamination. Anytime anyone was coming near them, they were forced to yell out, unclean, unclean, and it said that the people would pick up stones at that point so that if the person came any closer, they could begin to throw them at the leper to keep them at a distance. But in the Bible, leprosy is far more than just 
a disease. It's also used as a representation of sin. The leper was considered the embodiment of impurity in their culture. The external defilement of the disease was seen to represent the internal defilement in our hearts as sinners. The leper, in fact, one commentator says, was a living, breathing commentary on the effects of sin in our lives. Now, no one here has leprosy this morning, at least I'm willing to bet. But everyone here has problems with sin. And sin and leprosy, as you see Scripture comparing them, you begin to see how much alike they are. Leprosy, like sin, goes deeper than the skin. It goes beneath the surface. It starts out small, but it begins to spread throughout the entire person. It defiles everything that it touches. It causes isolation, but also it causes a lack of sensitivity, which can result in greater damage and destruction. The doctors cannot fix it, and we cannot get better on our own. But what can we do in this helpless state? What hope is there possibly for such a disease? Because for them, when they were told, when they would see the results on their skin, that leprosy was the disease that they had, it was a death sentence, a slow and grueling death sentence that would immediately isolate you and eventually take your life altogether. The man we read about in our text didn't have a small spot of leprosy. Luke, the doctor, makes it a point to tell us that he was actually full of leprosy. He's covered in it. In fact, the word he used here for full of leprosy, it's the same word he used back in chapter 4, verse 1, when he describes Jesus as being full of the Holy Spirit. And surely when we read that, we're not thinking, so Jesus had a little bit of the Holy Spirit on his pinky toe. No, you're thinking he's completely filled to the brim covered entirely by the Holy Spirit. And in that same word usage, Luke says this man is covered with leprosy. From head to toe, it is over his entire body. If we had to to list different severities of how bad someone had leprosy, this man is at the very end of it. It's not partial. He's covered. But before we begin to point the finger and and have pity on this poor man, we have to realize something, that we, like this man, are not mostly clean with a little dash of sin this morning. We are covered, we are smothered, we are filled to the brim with sin. But let's read what this man does in this state, desperate, alone, in critical condition, because I believe we can learn some instructions for what it might mean for us. We're told that as Jesus is passing through this city, that this man full of leprosy sees Jesus and he falls on his face and implores him saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. In his hopeless state, in isolation, this man catches a glimpse of Jesus and he is drawn to take action. In reckless desperation, what does he do? But he throws himself down on his face before Jesus and begs for cleansing. And as I mentioned, we tend to read this story and have pity on this man for his desperate state. We say things like, ah, that poor soul dying without hope. But what we need to realize is that Jesus is entering cities all around Galilee filled to the brim with people who are just as desperate and sick and hopeless as this man. The only difference is their disease is socially acceptable and primarily found in the heart and not on the skin. We look at this man and we say, oh, poor guy, no hope. What's he going to do? And yet Jesus is entering cities and as he approaches them, he's weeping because he sees sheep without a shepherd because he sees lost people who are just as desperate as this man, but they don't know it. Who are just as sick as this man, but they don't realize it. 
And when you begin to realize the state of all lost people in the world, you begin to actually appreciate the desperation of this man and see actually a benefit that he has knowing his lost state, knowing his lack of ability to help himself, seeing his desperation drawing him to the feet of Jesus. And better is a dying man desperate at the feet of Jesus than a healthy man blinded to the disease within his heart. Do you know what people need to know today in our world? Not that you're pretty good and you've almost got it all together, but I've got this solution to maybe add on to your life. People need to know that they are just as desperate and dying as a leprous man cast out of society, and their only hope is in Jesus. People need to be desperate. And in this moment, better is this desperate man who comes to Jesus in his time of need than all the people in that city who think they've got it all together and they're just fine. This man with our te- in our, within our text is blessed with the ability to at least see the, exist, see the disease that exists within all of us. He's lived with its consequences. He's felt its isolating effects. And he is drawn in humility to his only hope in Jesus. See, the reality is we may not have leprosy, but all the effects of leprosy are still awaiting those outside of Jesus. Because they will be cast out one day. It will numb and sear their conscience. It will cast them out. And it will result in ultimate death. The benefit this man has is that he's experiencing it now while on earth with an opportunity to respond and fall at the feet of Jesus. And he's desperate, but we also see something. This is a man not only full of leprosy, this is a man who's full of faith. He falls before Jesus and he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He doesn't question the power of God for a moment. Though there was no cure, though this is the first time this man has met Jesus, though it was covering and consuming his entire body, the only limitation he saw to being made well was whether or not Jesus so desired to heal him. He didn't see a problem with Jesus' ability even given his hopeless state. His only question is, Jesus, are you willing? Because if you're willing, I can be made clean. This leprosy that has slowly been destroying my body can be removed in a moment if you're willing. Look at the faith of this man. Now, it's interesting to note that there's more than just a physical healing that is needed here for this man. There's a mental and emotional healing and renewal that needs to take place as well. Listen to how Dr. A.B. McDonald, a doctor who oversaw a leper colony in Brazil, describes the mental and emotional damage that leprosy had on a person. He says, the leper is sick in the mind as well as the body. For some reason, there is an attitude to leprosy different to any other disfiguring disease, It is associated with shame and horror and carries in some mysterious way a sense of guilt. Shunned and despised, frequently do lepers consider taking their own lives, and some do. See, it attacked more than just the skin and the the hands and the feet and slowly decaying the outside of the body. Emotionally and mentally, these people were being destroyed from the inside out. They were covered in this sense of guilt and shame, constantly being known for their disease and being forced anytime they're around anyone to cry out, unclean, unclean, unclean. We're talking about a conference happening in March where people will know that they are made in the image of God. These people's identity was fully consumed and wrapped up in a disease. 
that each and every day they were reminded not only of the effects they felt, but the effects they saw of it around them when they saw anyone. I'm unclean, I'm unclean. And day after day, anytime someone's approaching, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, again and again. It marked their life. And how true is this even today of the damaging effects of sin on the mental and emotional state of people? People who have so identified with their sin that when you ask them, tell me about yourself, well, I'm an alcoholic. I'm a drug addict. Well, I'm the guy that got fired from five different jobs. I'm the high school dropout. I'm the the fill-in-the-blank. People that are so identified with their sin and their failure, and it, it marks them. Everywhere they go, they identify with it. They look at the whole world around them through the lens of this sin. A sense of guilt, a feeling of being shunned and despised. It's no wonder that suicides are on the rise when people are not brought to Jesus in their desperation because there is no hope apart from him. Sin will chew you up and it will spit you out. It will draw you in with empty promises about its satisfaction and its pleasure and then it will cast you out in condemnation and shame. And if people in this state are not given hope that there could be forgiveness for their wrongs in Jesus, if if people aren't told that there is redemption that is possible, that Jesus could wipe their slate clean and give them a new hope and a new future, if people fail to understand that though they are depressed and anxious, there is a renewing of their mind that could transform their lives, if they were brought to Jesus, why are we so, so surprised by their hopelessness? This man understood the doctors couldn't help him. Nothing in culture could make it better or make it go away. He was doomed without Jesus. And so is every person that has ever lived in this world. Because of sin, we are doomed without Jesus. And he comes to Jesus, his only hope, full of faith and humility to say, if you're willing though, oh God, if you're willing, I could be made well. Everything I've known Everything my life has been consumed by could be gone in a moment if you're willing. And we read this. Before Jesus has even said a word, what do we see him doing? He puts out his hand and he touches him. Jesus has just touched the person that was untouchable. Jesus has just reached out his hand to the person that was unreachable. Jesus has just gone in and removed the distance that this man has felt from every other person for as long as he's had this disease. And in compassion, Jesus comes into contact with him. Because this is what Jesus has been doing the entire time he's come to earth. He's reaching out to cast out people. He's removing the distance between God and man. He's coming in compassion to be in relationship with us. He's seeking to save that which was lost because the sick, they understand their need for a physician. And here's what I love. Did Jesus have to touch this man to heal him? No. This is the God who spoke everything into existence in the beginning. This is the same God who will go and heal people with a word, will come to a centurion man who says, you don't even need to go to my house. You don't even need to be in the area. If you just say the word, he'll be made well. But in this moment, he intentionally decides, I'm going to touch him before I even tell him I'm willing and he's cleansed. I'm going to touch him. 
He touched this man to demonstrate what he was about to confess, that he is willing. That he who knew no sin would become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, ceremonially, Jesus is becoming unclean by touching the man who is unclean. But you know what I love? Do we see Jesus getting leprosy because he touched a leper? No, we see the leper getting Jesus because Jesus touched the leper. When, D- when Jesus touches a sinful life, does he become sinful? No, but that life becomes cleansed. Jesus didn't tell the man he was willing. First, he showed the man that he was willing to touch him when no one else was. This was about more than God's ability to only heal the man. It was also God's ability to feel him, to touch him, to come in contact with him. The God who came to dwell among us. The God who can sympathize with our weakness the God who knew no sin and became sin for us, and not out of obligation, but because he was willing. Because he's full and moved with compassion. Because of his great love for us while we were still sinners when he died for us. While we were still lepers, he came and touched us and died for us. And maybe some people that are here today, maybe some people that are listening online, have got a whole list of reasons why God would never forgive what you've done. Reasons why you are convinced God would never use a person like you. Reasons why God so loves the world, but somehow you just didn't make the cut, and you're the exception to that rule. People who come in and, yeah, I know Jesus loves us and has plans for us, but you're still identifying with the sin and the mistake you made 5, 10, 15 years ago, and it still marks your life. And it's still the lens that you look at everything through. And before you identify as a son or a daughter of Christ, you identify with this struggle or this failure, this weakness or this disability within your life. And maybe like this man, you find yourself every Sunday coming to church, you find yourself every morning coming before the Word, and you're still asking that same question, are you willing, God? I know you can, I've I've read it, I've seen it in other people's lives, but are you actually willing to do it in my life? May Jesus' demonstration this morning in our text be a testimony to you today that He is willing Hear me loud and clear on this. He is willing. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how you define yourself, He's willing today, if you would come to Him, to give you a new identity, to give you a new purpose, to make you a new creation in Christ Jesus, where old things have passed away and all things are new. He gives the invitation to all who are weary and heavy laden to come to him and he will give you rest. Are you weary trying to carry that burden? Are you heavy laden with that identity you've been wearing that is not as a forgiven son and daughter in Christ? Come to him. He is willing. Romans 5, 6 through 8 says, For when we were still without strength, In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus didn't tell this leprous man, go away from me, I'll heal you at a distance, and then you can come into my presence and I'll touch you. Jesus touches the man before he heals him. He invites him into his presence as he is, and he makes him clean. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It wasn't when we turned our lives around and when we cleaned up our act and when we got everything together, when we had a whole month of reading our Bible every day and we've been praying for 20 minutes a day and I've told all my neighbors about Christ and now I can come to church and Jesus will be proud of me. 
The number of times I'd invited someone to church who says, oh man, pff, I stepped foot in that building, I'm going to get struck down. Like there's, there's some things in my life I need to clean up before I'd be welcome in that place. And I tell them, no, come as you are. You don't clean up your life and then come to Jesus. You come to Jesus and he cleans up your life. And for this leprous man, he comes. Even though all of society has cast him out, Jesus welcomes him in. And he humbles himself before Jesus, and Jesus says, oh, I'm willing, and I'm going to touch you even before I heal you. You came to the right place. And he makes him well. Are we giving people that invitation? Are we telling people that's the beauty of the gospel, that you come as you are? But when you come as you are into the presence of God, you don't leave the same. And we're told as this man comes to Jesus, he humbles himself, lays on the ground before him, says, if you're willing, and Jesus touches him and says, I am willing, and immediately the leprosy leaves him. In a moment, this man's life was changed forever. This man, once defined by his disease, has now been renamed. This man's future has just been rewritten. This man's home has just been moved. This man's interactions with others will never be the same. All because of Jesus. Church, do you realize just how much Jesus has done and accomplished for you? Just how much has been impacted by his willingness to remove your disease. Because you were given a new identity. You've been given a new home. You've been given a new family. You've been given hope. And as we see in the life of this man in our text, you've been given a new mission as well. This man in a moment is cleansed. He's made well not over time, but just in a moment because God was willing to heal him. And then he's given an instruction. Jesus charges him to go and show himself to the priest and to make an offering for his cleansing as a testimony to them just as Moses had commanded. In fact, he tells him, I want you to tell no one, but I want you to go straight to the priest's and allow the necessary sacrifices to be offered, the ceremonies to take place that might bring you back into society, ceremonially now cleansed and welcomed back in. And I just want you to think about the testimony this would have been to the priests at the temple. Because they were given instruction, according to Leviticus 14.10, of what that sacrifice and ceremony was supposed to look like. But I just want you to think about how thick the layer of dust was that was on the scroll that gave these instructions. Because they aren't having people weekly, daily, yearly at all coming in who are cleansed from leprosy. So this isn't a well-worn scroll that's something they're like, oh yeah, another guy cleansed of leprosy, let's go through the ceremony. He's coming in and he's like, hey, so I, I need to go through the sacrifices and the ceremony for a leper that's been cleansed. And they're like... Leper that's been cleansed. Where is that scroll? We, uh, let me look through. Maybe it's in the basement. Where do we put that thing? They're blowing off the dust like, okay, how does this work? We need to offer. They've never done this before. But they've never had a leper come in contact with Jesus before. And what a testimony it would have been that day in the temple. Because so they're going, what in the world is happening Oh, there's lepers in abundance, but never has there been a cure before. And in this moment, this man's life was meant to be a living testimony to those priests that that which was incurable is now curable in Jesus. That that which was a death sentence is now just an opportunity for God to show himself stronger. And God wants to use your life in the same way today. No, maybe it's not going to the temple after church to talk to some priests and have a sacrifice made on your behalf. 
but it looks like you going to those around you who knew your state before you came to Jesus and for them to see and be just as puzzled as they look at you and go, no, 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 no. I, I know Lucas. I don't know who you are. I, I know where Lucas was. I know the state he was in. I know the, the future that awaited him, and it was definitely not this one. So who are you and what happened? Well, I was a dead man who came to Jesus, and now I'm alive. And anybody who has come to Jesus, that is your story. Doesn't matter how deep you were in sin, or maybe the Lord protected you and kept you from a lot of that sin. Maybe you grew up in a home where you didn't fall into any deep, dark sins. That doesn't make your testimony less powerful or beautiful. You have a testimony because regardless of where you came from, you were dead in your trespasses, and Jesus has made you alive. A person once covered, filled to the brim with sin, now redeemed with a living hope and sanctified for a life in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a good testimony. That's a testimony people need to hear. And yet we read this man going out. And Mark chapter 1 gives us a little more detail. Mark actually rats him out. Here Luke's a little nice. He just says words going out everywhere. Mark tells us this man actually went out. And he just began to freely spread the matter even despite the instructions from Jesus. He just can't keep quiet. And, and I know we could point the finger. I'm like, look. If I'm in his shoes, if Jesus just cleansed me from leprosy, I'm probably doing the same thing. I'm trying to keep my mouth shut, but I'm like, okay, I just can't help it. Let me tell you, all right? It's, it's, I was a leper, and I'm cleansed. You see these clothes that are torn? That's because I used to have to scream out unclean, and now I don't. I'm just going to wander through the city, and nobody's going to be worried. He just can't keep silent. He couldn't hold back. He couldn't help but let slip the excitement about what had just taken place because his life is forever changed. The Bible commentator David Guzik brings out a painful realization here. He says, It is a strange fact that the one Jesus commanded to tell no one told everyone, and the ones who are commanded to tell everyone often tell no one. Jesus saved, healed, redeemed this man in a moment, says, tell no one, go to the priests, and he can't help it. He's like, I was on my way, I was doing good, but then I saw a friend, and then I saw a family member, and then I saw this stranger, and I'm like, they just need to know. And yet Jesus has done that same healing work in every one of our lives and says, now I want you to go, and I want you to make disciples of all nations. I want you to go spread the word to anyone that will listen. And we're like, nope, I'm going straight to my car, I'm going straight home, I am putting on tunnel vision, I'm not looking at anyone, I don't want to say anything. How shameful that we like this leper have been saved of so much, have been spared the wrath that is to come that we deserve, have been given a new hope and a new future, a new identity in Jesus, and he's not ashamed to call us one of his. Are we truly so ashamed of him before men? Perhaps it's because we've forgotten how far gone we were. How desperate we truly were. How far the gap was to God that was impossible for us to pass, to pass without him. And I hope that each and every morning as you get up, you remind yourself of where you were and now where you are because of Jesus and that it draws you to the same place that this leprous man now healed is at. Where you're like, I don't know who I'm going to see today, but I'll tell you what, I know what they're going to hear. They're going to hear some good news because I can't keep quiet. And that poor woman who's at the register at grocery outlet when she asks, how's my day going? Oh, she's going to hear about how my day is going. Let me tell you, I've got some good news today. 
And Jesus was willing to heal me when no one else was willing to come near me. I'm willing to speak to anyone who's willing to listen because I've got hope. Oh, that God would convict our hearts and send us from this place today like this man to proclaim freely and spread openly the news to anyone and everyone that will listen. The word spreads. Great crowds begin to come to Jesus. And as we close and I invite the worship team to come up, I love seeing his response. The crowds are coming The work is increasing, and we read, so he often withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. The demands increased. The crowds increased. And Jesus is pushed into a deeper place of prayer and time with the Father. The demands and the crowds and the work didn't push him from prayer. They pushed him to prayer. And if the Son of God, perfect and sinless, saw the need as things increased to spend even more time with the Father in prayer, how much more should you and I understand our need to be alone with the Father in prayer? One of my favorite quotes was Martin Luther when he said, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. Some of us can't even fathom the idea of 30 minutes of prayer. And he thought, man, I have got such a busy day ahead of me. When I look at the schedule today, it is nonstop. There is so much going on. I need to spend the first three hours in prayer. And before I see another person, I just need to spend time before the face of God. Because I need to be reminded that I have nothing to offer people out there. The only hope I have of seeing people impacted in a positive way as if Jesus goes before me. And I've been told by Jesus in John 15 that apart from him, I can do nothing. But when I abide in him and he in me, man, I can bear much fruit for the kingdom of God. We are in an extremely busy culture. And I don't know what your work looks like. But often, if you're a good worker, it doesn't mean you get less work. It means you get more, right? Your reward for working so hard and being so productive, we're going to give you more work. No, it doesn't come with a pay increase, but more responsibility and more work. Same amount of time. You feel like, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to accomplish all this? So I guess I'll get up earlier. I'll work longer. Now, Jesus has an example for you. Martin Luther would echo the words of Jesus to say, you need to spend more time with the Father. You need to spend more time in prayer. How sad is it that when our lives get busy, the first things we begin to neglect are the most important things, like time with the Lord, like times of prayer, like being still before Him. Oh, I don't have time for that. I got, I got to go throughout my day. There's things happening. But that we would be a people that learn from Jesus' example. Lucas, the needs are getting greater, though, and there's more people, and there's more things to do. Yeah, well, then I need to spend more time away, more time with the Father, more time listening to His voice, because there's a lot more voices, and they're getting louder, but I want to learn to discern His still, small voice. I want to be led by His Spirit, not by the the wants and desires of the people. want to be used by him in greater ways. What would this look like for you today? You know, my prayer as we close out our service this morning, as we have people available for prayer for you in the front and in the back, is that we would follow suit with this leprous man and we would recognize this morning how desperate we are. And you weren't just desperate at the day that you gave your life to Jesus and recognized the weight of your sin and its consequences and the need for forgiveness and salvation. We're just as desperate today because He has called us to be holy as He is holy. 
I don't know about you, but when I hear that as my standard, it's impossible. I can't live a holy day, let alone a moment. And you're calling me to live a life that is holy and set apart for you? I'm just as desperate today for Jesus as I was the day I came to him. But I hope as you come to that place of desperation, that like the leprous man, it draws you in humility before Jesus. That you run to him, the author and finisher of your faith. That you look to him for your strength. And that you allow him today for those of you that have been identifying for far too long by your sin to give you a new name. To remind you, no, you're part of a new family with a new purpose. And you have a new home and a new way of living. That you would allow him to remove those old ways you defined yourself and that you would leave here today as a beloved son and daughter of Christ that he has plans for, that he has a future home he's preparing, a son or daughter that he is well pleased in, and not because of all the things you can accomplish for him, but because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Please, this morning as we close in a few songs of worship, as there are, as there are people available that would love to pray with you, don't neglect the opportunity you have this morning like this man to be made right before God so that we can leave here with the right response of people who boldly and freely are proclaiming the goodness of God to anyone that will listen. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you for this reminder this morning. Lord, I love that the longer we sit in a text like this, the less we look at the leprous man as someone out there, and the more we begin to see the leprous man as us right here. Lord, it's the less we see other desperate people out there, and the more we see how desperate we are and in need of your help. And not just one moment, but each and every hour of every day, God, we need you. We are desperate for you. Lord, convict us of the areas in our lives where we've stopped being desperate for you. Lord, forgive us for the areas of our life we've allowed ourselves to be defined by something apart from you. God, I pray this morning that you would draw people into your presence as you did with this man. That they might find healing, that they might be cleansed, that they might remember the forgiveness that is theirs in Jesus. And where sin may abound, and we may be full of it, your grace abounds so much more. And that we no longer have to carry it because you have cast it as far as the east is from the west. Holy Spirit, would you do a cleansing in this place this morning that is desperately needing to be done? That we can leave this place confident of who we are in Jesus and the hope we have to offer others that the dead can come to life in you. For your glory, for your honor, for your praise. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray and all God's people said.